morning with a summary of the previous day involving Emory's Galactic Center and title description and how and so, uh, yes, uh, I'm going to, uh, this is a bit strange because uh, to some extent I'm going to summarize my own presentation, which is uh, nice and easy. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, dynamics uh, and uh, also event center and aggregation waves. This is a vegetable summary because uh, Mike is going to be talking then about the destruction event, right? So dynamics and the galactic center. Um, yesterday, uh, we heard in this uh, talk, given by uh, this guy, that uh, at, the, at the galactic center, there seems to be a deficit of uh, all stars. I mean, uh, this is based on number counts of the spectroscopically identified all stars, down to a magnitude of something like uh, 15.5, which means that uh, the uh, cusp that uh, we always uh, uh, have been uh, seen there, and that uh, we expect it to be there from a political point of view, is not anymore there, at least for the uh, old other stars. Now, the best fits seems uh, seem to be favoring slopes with a gamma less than one, and there is even the possibility of a core with a density decreasing, so that uh, you are, we're really talking about a, a, a carved pole in the stellar distribution, which is uh, kind of uh, strange because we don't expect this from a political point of view. So uh, again, let me point out that uh, we're talking about uh, detectable stars, which are essentially late-time giants, and these are a very small fraction of the stellar things that uh, we might expect to be in there. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, maybe it is too early to compute for the existence of a segregated gas, but uh, nevertheless, this is what uh, we are seeing right now. So uh, uh, I uh, um, so we saw yesterday that uh, if uh, if you assume uh, a standard uh, the standard mass segregation solution and expect uh, that uh, cost uh, to be wrong and that uh, you're going to be hitting the hull time and beyond and uh, that's a loss case, right? But uh, there has been a, a, a new uh, uh, or a generalization, if you want, of the bottom wall uh, solution that uh, predicts that uh, you can more efficiently segregate the massive uh, stars close to the center so that, uh, in principle, you are uh, in, uh, in the position of uh, re-blowing the stellar cast uh, well below our time. Now, uh, stellar casts may regrow on less than a half time, but the existence of core nuclei is still remains a possibility so that uh, we, were, we very likely will have to wait for better observations, like uh, well, we have to wait for the TMP, or closer in the future, maybe gravity will uh, help us understand uh, a little bit of what is going on there, because uh, it has uh, a significantly improvement in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the kind of uh, 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 observations that we can do. Now, red giants, again, can <coughs> uh, explain us this day, uh, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the, uh, this uh, missing red giants at the galactic center again. So uh, this is uh, something that uh, we have known since uh, something like the 1996, right? In the uh, uh, first uh, pioneering paper of uh, Hensel, he also predicted that uh, a possibility for explaining why do you do not see red giants at the galactic center is that uh, because of the very high uh, stellar densities that you have in there, you, cut, you could actually have physical collisions and you could be really destroying them. But uh, another possibility would be that uh, you have a secondary massive black hole at the galactic center <coughs> or a steady inflow of uh, yeah, inflowing clusters towards the center. Nevertheless, at least this, uh, well, these first uh, uh, possibilities, the solutions have been proven by uh, Melvin, as uh, well, he used to work, uh, he has uh, used something very strong, something like that, which, has, uh, which is a complete failure, or something like that. Uh, so I'm using new words. Uh, the secondary mass of cold and falling class are seem to be re very strong requirements. Now, the point uh, that uh, Xian made is that uh, this, uh, and uh, our Melvin was also uh, talking about this, 
is that uh, the stellar disk that we observe in our, our galaxy center must have been guessed at some point in its past. And uh, if you want to form uh, the stars, you have to fragment that, that Gaseous disk. And uh, in, a, in a void of it, you will be forming perhaps regions of over density with uh, densities much higher than you expect uh, from an homogeneous uh, 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 Gaseous disk. Now, these are dense enough contrary to that homogeneous uh, gaseous disk uh, to ensure an efficient removal of the outer envelope of the red giants. A star, nevertheless, on the, in the horizontal branch has an envelope which is about a hundred times uh, denser than a red giant, so that uh, you require of the order of, because of I'm, I'm missing the context here, so I didn't explain. The, the thing is that uh, you expect the red giant to be hitting the disk uh, again and again, and uh, you calculate the probability that it hits class, uh, clumps mm -hmm. of uh, very uh, high, uh, concentrate, highly concentrated gas, and uh, this will efficiently remove the envelope of the red giant. If you're talking about a horizontal branch uh, star, however, you require a hand more impacts as weak clump to efficiently remove the envelope, so that uh, only we expect that only a low percentage of them, those with a relatively low inclination of the Disk, uh, would have received or accumulated a significant number of uh, hits and therefore uh, 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 important uh, envelope damage. So uh, this, uh, if you're efficiently releasing cores, uh, you would, uh, of the, this red giant branch star, you would be populating the region of the galactic center with a lot of envelope. This is a prediction. So, gravitational waves have to speed up a little bit because Mike is talking to me. Uh, extreme maturation spirals, we like them a lot, at least uh, I, I like them a lot, because they're extremely good probes of the space and time around mass black holes. It's like uh, having a playing camera taking pictures of space and time around mass black hole. At the end of the process, five years during that, the file is converted into four uh, snapshots of the space and time, and then you can really, you're in there. The position of making of uh, of making a robust test of uh, GR in the strong regime, and uh, there is no other mission whatsoever in the history of astronomy that I can that can that, that is at the level of doing uh, this kind of tests. So this is really something unique uh, to a mission like uh, LISA. The uh, battle solutions uh, that I was talking about uh, predicts uh, uh, an unrealistic high event rate of the extreme pressure spirals because it is using an unrealistically high uh, density, number density of uh, black holes. When you take realistic numbers, then the, the uh, event rates uh, uh, decrease enormously. But uh, the point is that uh, when you use the correct uh, uh, solution for mass aggregation, you don't run into this scenario. You get uh, uh, reasonable numbers of event rates. So, uh, yeah. Spin matters for uh, spin matters and spirals. So uh, uh, I think this is uh, <coughs> something that uh, takes a well, it's, it's not uh, as uh, easy, but uh, as I want to descri describe now, uh, very loose way. But the point is that uh, there is a radius within which any spin matters and spiral is going to be uh, 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 it's going to be secure. You cannot deflect it out of the uh, orbit that uh, eventually will make it uh, become an, a, a real spin matrix spiral. So it's going to be spanning temporary three, temporary four orbits, cycles within the distant band. When you go beyond that uh, radius, which is uh, very close to the uh, to the massive black hole, when you're getting to the bulk of the stars in the distribution, the problem is that uh, that you run into is that the gravitational deflections at our center very likely will, uh, uh, will uh, change the orbital parameters of the star so that it will be really set, <coughs> sorry, will, uh, will be set on an extremely regular orbit. And uh, in principle, if the central mass black hole is not spinning, you will hit it and uh, you, you're not getting them to a three cycles. You will get a few bursts, maybe, but not more. Now, we know that the massive black holes are spinning. And uh, as uh, well, Mike was also explaining this yesterday, uh, spinning makes the elastic orbit uh, to be much closer to the horizon. In the case of prograde orbits, uh, 
and uh, but it pushed the way for greater withdrawal. So fortunately, this is not a symmetric uh, uh, situation, and uh, you win for progress of this. So uh, yeah, you uh, enhance uh, the uh, uh, event way because uh, for the simple reason that uh, you are getting to a region where you have the bulk of the stars, you are uh, gaining, say, a factor of 10 in radius, you are gaining a factor of, of, of a thousand in your observable volume, and uh, this is important. And this is already important for states of about the order of seven. Uh, yes, there's uh, an important point here. These emeralds are very centric compared, compared to those uh, from which we thought uh, that there were secure, those which uh, were very close to the mass of the core, you can have a sphere of radius of uh, yes, a hundred of the factor. Now, as a, as a, as a yeah, uh, simplification of this, they are going to be louder so that you can see them far and far away, so the horizon distance goes farther away, and uh, <coughs> implicitly you are also enhancing rate for them. This is something that we did not take into account in the, in the, in the, uh, the paper, but it's something that was uh, investigated, I think. Okay. And uh, the nice thing is that uh, uh, you know about the choice of barrier. Uh, the choice of barrier is a phenomenon that happens when you're very close <coughs> to the mass of black hole, when you are within that sphere of radius 100 of Vasek. But uh, for producing these uh, fake planets, as I call them, but uh, that, that name is misleading. Misleading. Uh, you just need uh, two value relaxation, which is very nice because uh, two value relaxation we understand relatively well, and it's a chaotic process, it's not a secular process. So distance do not see, at least uh, uh, those uh, uh, initial radii, they do not see this special area. What happens later is not So, so LIGO, <coughs> Imbris, Steve, Rasko was talking about this yesterday. So uh, you know, for Elisa, that uh, the ESA Senior Survey Committee has spoken, but they still have to go to ESA Space Science Advisory Committee, SSAC. I, it, this took me actually a while to find out what uh, this acronym should have this day. Uh, to the Director of Science, B S R E, don't ask me what that is. And then to the SPC. When will that happen? But it looks like. We know that in the cosmic vision, well, this is for sure. L1 is going has gone to Jews, 232. Uh, L2 to Athena Plus, which uh, has an tentative uh, uh, launching date of 2028. Uh, L3 to Elisa, 2034. I mean, this is just a recommendation, but the, the, the decision that I have to make uh, is going to be, I think, the next month or something like that. And they've never not gone with the recommendations before. <coughs> but uh, in the meanwhile, what about uh, LIGO INGRIS intermediate mass resonance spirals? So, uh, Steve was showing us in, uh, in his uh, movies yesterday that uh, a forecast, you have something that uh, really is looking very similar to what uh, you are used to. When, uh, you know, I mean, if you are looking, if you have been looking at them for a long time, like me, uh, you get uh, some of the behavior that uh, you are used to, like uh, you get these resonances, etc. And uh, that was very interesting. The problem is that our foreheads, there is, uh, well, we don't have such an observatory. I mean, LIGO is not uh, starting there. And uh, there's nothing planned, not even this uh, Chinese uh, uh, research concept. But uh, I think the Persian might want to correct me. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. So uh, at LIGO frequencies, the nice thing is that you obtain tens of bursts. But the important thing here, I mean, uh, uh, we uh, cannot rest in this on the slide yesterday, was of like a few tens of bursts. But uh, the nice thing is that uh, these are coherent bursts. We're talking about a one source. We're talking about a stellar, a compact object flying around a young age. We do not know whether actually this exists, but they are. And uh, this is, uh, these birds are coming from a coherent source, so that uh, you really, uh, uh, well, compared to a real stream of motion spiral, where you have to the four cycles with three cycles, uh, well, this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is not looking that, uh, that nice. But uh, nevertheless, as uh, you say in English, but also in 
Spanish, some look at it for But nevertheless, the dynamics is different. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, graphic no play on supermassive codes, the dynamics that we have in there is uh, similar, but uh, it is not quite the same thing for globular clusters or ultra ondal dwarf galaxies, like uh, this uh, extremely massive uh, uh, cluster of mega array and ion pH. So we will have to do some uh, rethinking. Now, uh, black hole perturbation of waveforms, which uh, uh, Steve uh, mostly referred to as a uh, uh, are actually reproduction to a very good degree what we obtain in 4 gr The spectral clues is at the level of the course is Sasaki Nakamura, at least this is what I understood from the, uh, the slide of uh, Steve. <coughs> and uh, the problem here is that uh, when they want to compare to new rails, they can run the, their waveforms on, 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 on their laptops in a couple of uh, hours, maybe, but uh, full uh, numerical readily, you cannot do that, right? So, uh, because uh, we have made the way long evolutions uh, under very high conditions in spiral regime. But uh, so far, the agreement looks uh, quite impressive, at least to me. So, for instance, for a mass ratio of uh, 4 or 1 or 4, depending on how you kind of have 1 and 2, the overlap is 0.994, which uh, looks extremely well for astrophysicists, uh, but uh, for a uh, you know, good year, you're probably not uh, quite there, but uh, you're getting very close. There is, can be a disagreement in formalism or simply numerical errors that uh, you have in your numerical relativity simulations, I don't know. Uh, but in any case, I think uh, this is extremely uh, uh, worth uh, interesting and uh, worth investigating. And uh, in any case, I am going to be with them in the next uh, uh, month. And that comes to the second head. Thank The afternoon of uh, day two, uh, the presentation is focused on tidal disruption events and stuff. The stuff refers to the tidal debris, of course, that is released after a tidal disruption event. Um, I will go through the presentations in order, but on the fly, maybe I'll try to change the order. Uh, the opening presentation was by uh, James Dye, and it was an extremely useful pedagogical, uh, clear introduction to the problem. Um, the focus of the talk was um, how general relativistic events influence the outcome of the calculation. And as she noted, GR is important for deeply plunging orbits, beta greater, greater than one. That means the uh, pericenter distance is um, significantly smaller than the tidal disruption radius. Um, the effect of GR is on the energy distance for one thing, uh, and the result is that the debris return rate declines uh, faster than due to the minus five terms. Uh, this was a substantial difference. So there was a substantial difference between the relativistic and non -relativ and Newtonian results, and that actually led to Chuck Evans to ask what is the big difference. And I think that discussion uh, did not resolve the question adequately. Another major effect by caused by GR is the precession of the orbits, and this is particularly interesting for um, inclined orbits around the spinning black hole. The precession can throw the debris out of the orbital plane. And that is interesting because it influences circularization. The discussion that, that uh, was presented in, in this talk focused on circularization due to stream self-intersection. So the general relativistic precession uh, might cause the stream not to self-intersect, also influences the thickness of the stream that in turn has an effect on the probability of self intersection. Okay. Ah, okay, I'll skip this and I'll go to this one. The next theory talk was by Mike Kesden, and it's all laid out here. <laughs> uh, he, his emphasis was um, on the influence of the black hole spin on the tidal disruption rates and light curves. He's provided his notes, and I think those will be posted, and you'll see everything in all. All its glory, all the details are in the notes. Uh, 
Um, I will just say quickly what his uh, emphasis was. He um, calculated the debris return rate and also the rate of events. He found that the debris return rate for a very highly spinning black hole can peak earlier and the uh, amplitude can be larger than the non-spinning case. But at the end, at late times, the return rate um, becomes 2 to the minus 5 thirds, as we would expect in the Newtonian case. As far as the event rates, uh, those can be affected by capture. So some of the objects that are within the tidal disruption radius can get so close to the black hole that they can get captured. I think he recovers the Newtonian rate for black hole masses around 10 to the 6. And then the rate drops sharply for higher breadth black hole masses. Um, the spin of the black hole comes into play because it influences the radius of the horizon. And so the fraction of objects, that, the fraction of events where the star will be captured will be determined by the spin of the black hole. And then the, the theory, the last theory talk was by Roxanne Chen. She presented a formulation of the problem in terms of normal coordinates. And that, uh, that formulation allows one to examine the stage of closest approach in exquisite detail. And because of that uh, exquisite detail, she was able to apply the, the analysis to the disruption of a white dwarf time intermediate mass black hole. The black hole has to be of intermediate mass so that the tidal disruption radius is outside of the event horizon in the case of a white dwarf. Um, she discussed at length the process of partial surgery. She noted that the process is inherently asymmetric. So mass is lost on one side a little more than on the other side. As a result of this asymmetry, which uh, needs to be treated very carefully to become evident, the remnant uh, can receive activity that can be as large as 1,500 kilometers per second. The late time return rate that she computes is uh, also two to the minus five thirds at late times. But the peak rate was very, very, I think that raised some eyebrows and it came up for discussion later and I don't remember if we resolved uh, the issue. Can it be as high as 10 to the seven? I think, so. or was the scale on the plot? Uh, the return rate, I, I did it in terms of MN10, so it was close to 10. Uh, for the 500 solar mass, So now I'm going to backtrack a little bit and go to the observational talk. I wanted to group the theory talks together. Brian Chernoff gave uh, the observational talk where he reported uh, tidal on tidal disruption events discovered by pan stars. In the process, he gave a review of discoveries from the Rosa era where the temporal sampling was kind of sparse. You had to rely on whenever the observations were available. Uh, he also summarized uh, events observed by Galax before the Panzer surveys got going. And the focus of his presentation was an event discovered by Panzers and also observed by Galax. So a quick summary of the properties of the Panzer events. The spectral energy distributions of these events looks, look very much like black holes. Temperatures of order 2 times 10 to the 4. They are typically weak in X-rays. And as such, they differ from those discovered by Rosa. And we're really not sure what this means. Uh, it may be that we're looking at a continuous distribution of SEDs, and Rosa just is good at, at catching the X-ray bright ones, whereas Galax is good at catching the, and pan stars are good at catching the optical and UV bright ones. Uh, the light curves drop approximately at two to the minus five thirds. That's a very interesting um, result. However, all of these conclusions are sensitive to uh, how one interprets uh, the measured quantities and compares them with uh, theory. Uh, theory predicts the debris fallback rate, whereas observations measure luminosity in a band. So one has to be careful in how the luminosity in a given band is converted to volumetric luminosity and then how the volumetric luminosity is interpreted to give an accretion rate or a fallback rate. The other point that Ryan made was that there's a wide diversity in event properties. The events that we studied in detail, there's no two that are alike. Some of them have emission lines, others don't. Some are detected in x-rays, others are not. 
clearly, in my opinion, we need a much larger sample before we start to think about the population of immense. And I'm optimistic that LSST will provide such a large sample. And to inject some commentary, I think when LSST comes along, we'll be in trouble because follow-up facilities are going to be very scarce, and we won't be able to follow up the wide variety of events that LSST will do. I talked about this, I talked about this. At the end of the day, we had a lively discussion, instigated and motivated by Tamara. The main theme of the discussion was uh, where does the optical light come from in a tidal disruption event, and how do we decipher the shape of a light curve? And the issues that we discussed, and I'm not sure whether we resolved them or not, but a lot of interesting, uh, a lot of in a lot of interesting ideas were presented during that discussion. I actually enjoyed it. Um, so, how does the debris circularize, and how quickly? This uh, has a lot to do with whether we expect accretion-powered light or light powered by shocks in the splash that the tail of returning debris makes when it finds the pre-existing gas flow to the tidal areas. Um, is there a, a substantial emission of the, spl of the splash? So at the end, the summary that Tamara gave, I think, was quite appropriate. We cannot bypass the problem of figuring out how the photons produced in the event get out of the shroud. And all the, uh, all the details, calculating all the details of that process are quite crucial so that we know how to interpret what we see in terms of physical processes that are going on there. Okay. Now, this was the last discussion of the day, but uh, <laughs> there were post-discussion activities, <laughs> and it took place at the court, 7th Street and uh, Cypress. The, this is a view of the interior <laughs> of the restaurant. <laughs> of Alberto. Um, Alberto, do you know that they have a picture of your dinner on their website? I don't know how they did it, but there it is. <laughs> um, during, during this post-discussion discussion, we carried out some experiments. For example, Steve Drasco tried to choke the accretion of wine into Pao's uh, glass, and he succeeded in the end, and that was quite a good thing to do because we don't know if Pao could have made it home. Uh, if he was allowed to accrete all of the returning uh, the from the wine bottle. As long as there was no feedback. So that's it. Thank you. There was a vibrant discussion yesterday, post talks and post post talk, but we've got some time for a little more wrap up.